be back today. But we are going to get started in the morning service. It is a blessing to be back. This is our second Sunday being back. Last Sunday, of course, was Father's Day, and we're excited that the fathers got spoiled. I know I did, amen, and I trust all the fathers got spoiled last week as well, amen. Last Sunday of the month, and then the next Sunday will be into July, and uh, the 4th of July weekend, so I'm sure everybody's excited about fireworks. We missed it last year because it was raining, so uh, we didn't get any uh, uh, good fireworks in. Got a little bit, but it got some, uh, so praise the Lord for that. Before we actually go into our first song, let me give you an update on Brother Bird. Of course, you remember the last time we talked about Brother Bird, he had the blood clot in his leg. They talked about uh, amputating the leg, and uh, he was going to take some blood thinners to see if that could cure it. And let me read you the update that he sent out. He says, your prayers to God on our behalf are effectual and are being heard in heaven. As many of you have heard, I've had, had emergency surgery done on my left leg due to the complete blockage of the blood clot in the aneurysm behind my left knee. I am including the emergency May, May prayer letter for those who may have forgotten about that in the email that I sent. Of course, he sent the last one as well. I'm totally convinced that it is Almighty God's faithful sa uh, saints uh, that God is allowing me to keep my leg through prayer. I met with my primary vascular surgeon on June 6th. Uh, for a follow-up post-surgery visit and ultrasound of the aneurysm in my abdomen. The aneurysm in my abdomen is stabilized, and my doctor does not feel that she needs to do any repair at this point. She then listened for the blood flow in my left foot, but could not detect any blood flow by ultrasound. However, she did confirm that somehow blood flow, though minimum, is getting down to my leg and foot. That's a blessing right there. Uh, she noted that there are no other surgical procedures that is available for me at this time. So the game plan for now is for me to take baby steps and exercise in an attempt to expand the blood vessels that are currently supplying up blood to my leg and foot. This is going to take a long period of time as I battle each day and push past the pain to expand the blood vessels over a period of time. Uh, it will not be an overnight event unless the Lord does a miracle, which no doubt he is able. Amen. As you can see in the photo, I'm taking those baby steps using a walker. He's got a picture here of him on a walker uh, in my therapy. He says, I am making progress each day. However, it is at night during sleep that is the most dangerous for me. My left leg below the knee can literally go dead due to the lack of blood flow to it. I'm awakened by pain and numbness in my foot and toes, which prompts me to massage my foot to get circular, uh, circulation to flow again. I sleep with a foot heating pad to keep my foot warm and to assist in blood circulation. I'm exploring the possibility of some sort of passive motion machine to exercise my leg while I am asleep. That would make for a difficult night of sleep for me. Amen. Please pray the Lord will prosper this effort. As far as our church plan, I've met with our small congregation via Zoom, and our game plan is to hold virtual services for four to six weeks to give me enough time to heal to where I can stand and preach or sit in person. The plans for change of use for our present meeting location was rejected by the city. As a result, we have to vacate the premises by the end of June. So it really kind of worked out hand in hand because he can't go to the church anyway. So the certificate of use that they wanted to get changed uh, is not going to be available, so they will have to move anyway. That gives them time, whilst he's recovering as well, to find other means. Their plan is to meet in a hotel that's nearby uh, for the time being. So do pray for Brother Bird and his precious wife as well as they uh, face this battle of recovery and try to get back into ministry there in North Carolina in the Charlotte area, amen, because they definitely need your prayer. So I definitely want to make sure I gave you that information. I know several have asked about an update, and uh, that is uh, the update. Amen. Well, again, I want to welcome you out this morning. Welcome our viewers out. Pray for Brother Bird. Uh, pray for their church there in New Mexico, New Mexico, in Charlotte. Amen. Uh, that God will work a marvelous work of grace. Amen. Welcome to our viewers online as well. Going to sing our first hymn this morning, uh, 138, Love Lifted Me. 138 in your hymnals. When nothing else could do, love lifted me. One thirty-eight hymnals should be in front of you. Amen. One thirty-eight. 
I was shaking deep and sin, far from the peaceful shore. Every deep place stayed within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, I'll save them, I see now. second stanza all my heart to him I give ever to him I cling and his blessed presence live ever his praises sing love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best song faithful love exalts to, to him belongs stands a 138 souls in danger look above jesus completely saves he will lift you by his love out of the angry waves he is the master of the sea fellows his will obey be your savior wants to be me say to do that chorus here a cappella. I love the sound of voices. Amen. And uh, it is good to know. By the way, one morning we may not have electricity. We're going to have to sing it a cappella anyway. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Love lifted me. We're going to get the a cappella there. Gregory will give us the start. And then you pick it up. Amen. Here we go. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Amen. Aren't you glad for God's love? Amen. If it weren't for God's love, where would we be? Amen. The love of God is amazing, to say the least. Amen. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, trusting him to work in Brother Bird's life and our lives as well. Father, we thank you once again for the love that, that you use to lift us out of the miry clay, out of sin's degradation, and into heaven's pearly gates. Lord, thank you for loving us enough to send Jesus Christ to die for our sins on the cross, a cruel cross, Lord, and giving us the ability to claim salvation by faith through the grace of God. And Lord, we do plead the blood of Jesus today for the healing of Brother Bird that you might work in his life. Miraculous way, Lord, the, the leg could be 
amputated. It could have been amputated by now, but Lord, you allowed the minimal circulation to get through. Give the doctors breakthrough wisdom. Give the doctors breakthrough guidance and understanding and surgically guide them to do what they need to do to repair this man of God, that he may be what he needs to be for his congregation, be what he needs to be for you, and being uh, what he needs to be for his wife and his family. Most of all, Lord, just continuing uh, the ministry that you've given him there in the Charlotte area. Uh, we do lift up our voices, Lord, in asking you to move in a marvelous way for those that are listening online. Bless the hearers there. Uh, Lord, to stay, stay them from distractions in their places of home or wherever they're at right now, listening online across the world, across the state in Tucson, wherever they're listening, Lord, clear distractions, help them to pay attention today on purpose. And then for us here in the congregation, thank you for the, uh, the blessed brethren that you brought out today. And I do pray that each one would be tuned to praise you and then tuned to please you as they hear the preaching and what you would have them to do and how you would have them to act. Bless now in all the endeavors that we have before us today. And through it all, Lord, may a life be changed, a life be challenged, and praise be given for who you are and what you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen. And uh, amen. Well, a couple things here on uh, the announcement list that I want to give you. And first, when I brought up last week, there will be a budget meeting upcoming for last year's budget. We want to get that approved, and we're working out the final details on that. So here within the next couple of weeks, we'll have that uh, ready for you. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Also, I will be trying to make some visits here over the next several weeks as well. We've not had a chance to do that since COVID. Uh, and out of respect to the fears that some had and things of that nature. So we want to get back on that again and making sure we can get out, make some visits. You know, I've not been able to make any hospital visits at all for the last couple of years, wow. uh, which pains my heart to, you know, that I couldn't do that. And so I apologize for that. But the hospitals just wouldn't let you in. Amen. Uh, family members couldn't even get in on certain cases. So. Uh, be praying about that, and I'll be in contact with you about when it's going to be a good time for you to come out and spend just a few minutes. Don't worry about preparing food for us and things of that nature. We don't need that. I just want to sit down and talk to you, see how you're doing. Amen. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Uh, also, Pastor and Mrs. White are going to be out uh, the next week, uh, probably two weeks, for their anniversary. How many years is it going to be, brother? 41? He's looking at Mrs. White. <laughs> 41, amen. So they'll be out for the next couple of weeks so celebrating their anniversary. At the same time, he's going to be moving his aunt Virginia from California uh, to North Carolina. So pray for that. A lot of logistics going into that. A lot of planning that Pastor Mrs. White have to do to get her from point A to point B. Uh, she's not able to walk on her own, and so there's going to be a lot of things and assistance that she'll need to get there. Uh, so pray for that whole moving process of his aunt back to uh, North Carolina. It's going to be for her uh, best uh, interest because she does need some assistance uh, medically speaking and more family is back there as well. Uh, so do pray for Pastor and Mrs. White as they make both of those things happen, their anniversary travels and moving of uh, his Aunt Virginia. And then on a sad note here, the Leslies will be having their last service with us on July 10th. Uh, they're going to be moving to Silver City, New Mexico uh, with uh, Paula's mom and dad. Uh, he's uh, in one of the stages of his Alzheimer's there. They want to move back closer to him, spend a little bit more time with him whilst he can remember those things. And Fred has a job that's movable, right, brother? Amen. So he can actually move his job there and do it online. So that is a blessing to have that advantage. And you can retire at any time anyway, right? So, amen, if he wants to, he can drop the mic and say, I'm done, amen, and uh, be through. So uh, they'll, their last service here will be July 10th. So do be in prayer uh, for their move and as they try to get things there. But July 10th will be their last service. And, brother, will you be able to sing for us in your last service? Amen, amen. Brother Duffy, will you be able to sing with us? Amen. I called him on the spot on that one day. Sure, 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 Pastor. He'll come to me afterwards and say, I'm not singing on my last service. No, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but no, praise God. Pray, appreciate everything that Fred and Paul and the Leslie's have done. They've been a blessing to us. Watch the kids grow up here. And uh, jo Josiah is now 17. 17. Mariah is 15, 16, 14. Amen. Yeah, so they've grown up right here. I remember them all being in the nursery around about the same time with G2. It's a blessing. Also, Jeff's been gone. Jeff had COVID, so I definitely uh, pray for him. He's recovered, doing good now, so good to have him back. I missed my amen man while I was gone. Amen. 
Uh, so do be in prayer for those things coming up here over the next couple weeks. Be safe on the 4th of July weekend, especially if you're doing any travels, if you're playing with, uh, playing, that's a bad word. If you're doing fireworks, amen, shouldn't be playing with fireworks, should be setting fireworks off. Do that safely. Please don't play with fireworks. That's not a good thing to do. Amen. All right, 416, my faith has found a resting place. We're going to sing that. 416, my faith has found a resting place. I trust yours has too. Faith has found a resting place for 16. All right, here we go with that first stanza. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one. His wound for me shall bleed. I need no one. us being recipients of salvations if God didn't do another thing for us you know it's enough he's done what he needed to do amen uh, and if he never blessed us from this point on it is enough that Jesus died and notice that he died for me amen personalize your salvation yes God loves the world but God loves you God loves you and thinks about you amen I, I love singing this because it says and he died for me Amen. Second stanza, enough for me that Jesus saves. Here we go. Enough for me that Jesus saves. This is my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him. He'll never cast me out. I need no one. stands and my heart is leaning on the word the written word of God when you say that last part and that he died for me emphasize me amen uh, because God loves me you say well, what about us and you too amen that's why you're going to emphasize it for you amen all right my heart is leaning here we go my heart is leaning on the word the written word I want to do that acapella as well. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. Amen. Speaking of arguments and pleas, you know what's happening in our nation's capital with abortion. Amen. There will be arguments and there will be pleas. Amen. But I don't care which side of the fence you stand on, God values life. I, I will say that emphatically. God values life. If we're not so he wouldn't send Jesus Christ to save our lives. Amen. And so God values life. You may be on one side, you may be on the other. And I know there's a lot in between, but God values life and he died for us. Amen. So let's sing that chorus there. I need no other argument. G2 is going to give us a lead and we'll be good. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Amen. I am so glad that he did. 
turning your Bibles in preparation for the preaching this morning to Genesis 20. Genesis 20. And we're going to be in verses 1, 2, and 3. Continuing with our theme this morning on the But God series, how God steps in and changes things for his beloved. John, or John, Genesis chapter 20, and we'll be in verses 1, 2, and 3. G2 is going to come up and sing for us. Where did he go? He disappeared. Oh, there he is. Amen. I uh, say so he disappeared. Great Houdini. Amen. All right. So G2, you come on up and sing for us. And then uh, Genesis 20 is where we'll be this morning. Amen. So you turned into faith. Surrender, Lord, I 
I surrender my life. I give it all to you. Thank you, Gregory. I appreciate that blessed message in song. I surrender. Amen. We actually tried to get him seen that last year for Father's Day. But uh, praise the Lord. Uh, we didn't push it, and uh, he finally just said, you know what? I'm ready for that. And I said, well, amen. Praise the Lord. Let's have it then. He said, when you want me to do it? Sunday. Amen. Sunday's good as day as any. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Uh, Genesis chapter 20. So thank you, Gregory, for that uh, message. Amen. I surrender. And uh, stand with me if you're able for the reading of God's word. We're going to read verses 1, 2, and 3, uh, continuing uh, the theme of but God, how God steps in and changes some things for you and for me, either to prevent us from doing some things and uh, all of the above. Today is no different. God is going to step in here and uh, protect Abraham and Sarah and give a warning to a guy by the name of Abimelech. Abimelech, what's his title, I should say, amen. Abimelech, amen. Genesis 20, verses 1, 2, and 3. If you are there, say amen. amen. If you're there online, say amen. I don't hear they're not there yet, so let's keep waiting. Say, no, I'm just joking, amen. All right, 20, and uh, notice the Bible says, And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country, and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur, and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. We've been there before, haven't we? Amen. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. We've been there before too. Read verse 3 with me. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Amen. Notice that, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night. We're going to start today with the development of biblical dreams or divine intervention of your dreams and look at this particular passage and see how God came in and protected Abraham and Sarah, but at the same time gave a warning to Abimelech. And over the next several weeks, we're going to try to develop Biblical dreams. What does a dream mean when somebody dreams in the Bible? What, what was God trying to get at in that? And does he still do it for today? Interesting concept. Father, bless now. Help the, the listeners online and the, the congregation here to have open ears, open eyes, open hearts to what we're going to talk about. Well, as we develop this over the next couple of weeks, I do pray that you would give me clarity from on high, filling of your spirit the divine leading that, Lord, we can discuss this area of the scripture and this particular topic about dreams. Lord, work and arrest souls, men, women, boys, and girls. Some need to be saved. Some need to go in a certain direction. Some need to be prevented from going in a direction. And show us what you would have for us to see with this subject matter over the next several weeks. Save lost souls. Lord, for the glory of God, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. You may be seated. Amen. Does God still speak to us today in our dreams? You hear this phrase, some say, follow your dreams. Yes, of course, they're speaking figuratively about going after a passion that you have. But is it wise counsel to follow our dreams as a born-again, Bible-believing, trusting Christian in the Word of God? Should we follow our dreams? Over the next several weeks, we're going to investigate the development of biblical dreams. We're going to start here today with Abimelech and uh, this dream that uh, he has, and then go into some other areas dealing with dreams. First of all, let me say this. I'm no dream expert, and I'm no dream authority. So get that down right now. It's my disclaimer. I'm not a dream authority. I'm not a dream expert. Amen. I am a Bible reader, though. And I know many people in the Bible have had dreams. So we're just going to examine some biblical dreams, draw some applications for Christians today, and we'll go. We all dreamed last night. Yes, we did. 
Now, some of you can remember what you dreamt. Others can't. But we all dreamed last night. It's already been proven that we all dream when we go to sleep. Uh, and uh, when it comes to that, can you remember your dream? And if you could, what would be the outcome if you acted on your dream? For some of us, it would be tragic. What would be the outcome if you acted on your dream? What if God directed you to do something in your dream? Would you do it? By the way, what I, I, will, I submit this. I've been saved now. Uh, over 30 years, 30, what, 34 years now, been saved? I'm getting old, so I forget. Got saved in 1991. February what? Third, amen. So I've been saved for a while. And you know, since I got saved, God called me to preach. You know, I never dreamed about preaching in my entire life. And then God led me to pastor a church. You know, I never dreamt about pastoring a church. Some people base their whole life on what they dreamed, and they say, well, well, I dreamed it, so it must be true. If that is the case, then I shouldn't be a pastor, because I never dreamed about being a pastor. I never dreamt about planting a church. Never. Ooh. So that goes to me that God does not lead by only dreams. You know what he leads by? His Holy Spirit and his word. Do dreams play a part in that? They can, as we're going to see. They can. I'm not going to discount that altogether. But I am just saying I never dreamt about preaching or being called to preach or pastoring a church. Never dreamed about that. But yet, and still, that's what God called me to do. Yeah. What if God directed you to do something? Would you do it? And atrocities have been carried out because people acted on their dreams. Amen. Down through the ages, atrocities have happened because people acted on their dreams. Martin Luther King said he had a dream, and great things came from that. Yeah. I'm just saying we don't follow solely our dreams as Christians, and we'll develop this as we go on, but God may use the dreams. Yes, dreams have been a mystery for years, going all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. Much is said in the Old Testament, but very little is said in the New Testament about dreams. I wonder why. I wonder why. Much is said about dreams in the Old Testament. Very little is said about dreams in the New Testament, very little. God has used dreams over and again to get the attention of both saved and unsaved. By the way, God often uses dreams for the unsaved more than the saved because the unsaved don't know God, neither do they have the Holy Spirit of God, and therefore, in a superstitious way, they know God by their conscience that's been grained over time, and so they know there is somebody, something out there by their conscience. So. The Bible oftentimes uh, uses the saved with dreams, but it also uses the unsaved. I'll give you two quick illustrations. I had a co-worker, and uh, his son loved The Simpsons. I mean, I know Bart Simpson and Homer. I think I told you all this before. He saw an episode where Bart Simpson went to hell. And he dreamt about going to hell himself. And guess what? He woke up, went to church, and got saved. What happened? God used a dream to get him saved. God used a dream to get him saved. Another instance, me and my wife, we prayed for my brother-in-law who was in a coma. Yeah. And I told y'all that story too. And we prayed specifically like this, Lord, whilst he's in his coma, give him the fright of his life about hell so that he can get saved. Yeah. He came out of his coma. We went to the hospital. Uh, wherever he was at, we went there. And we got the privilege to lead him to the Lord. The Lord. After he got saved. I asked him, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, while you were in your coma, did you have any strange dreams? You know what he said? Man, I dreamed about fire and hell, and I was going there. I said, yes. God answered prayer, got him. Got him in his dream. Two unsaved people that I know personally God used to get them saved by their dreams. You and I have something better. We have the Holy Spirit of God. And we have the Word of God. But unsaved, oftentimes, God can use their dreams because they don't know God in a special way like we do. Sometimes our dreams are good. Sometimes they're bad. Sometimes they're funny. Sometimes they're sad. Sometimes they're scary. Sometimes they're thought-provoking, leading you to wonder why you even dreamt what you dreamt. Amen. Just the other day, uh, my wife woke me up from a dream. I dreamed that I was fighting Adolf Hitler. So why did you dream that? I have no idea. 
But in the dream, he was over there, and I was doing some kind of karate or kung fu. I did a flip, and I kicked him. Wow! Oh, yeah. And I kicked the cover, slap off of us. My wife said, honey, honey, what's wrong? I said, I just dreamed I was kicking Adolf Hitler. I went right back to sleep. <laughs> like nothing happened. Next thing I know, I was in a football lineup. I was a tailback. They was running a sweep left. They said, we're running a sweep left. I was waiting for the ball. And one of the linemen stepped in front and caught the ball. And if somebody hit him, he fumbled. And I went to grab for the ball. And when I went to grab, my arms reached out like that in my dream. Carmen said, what's wrong with you now? I said, I dreamed I was playing football. And the, the lineman, fat lineman, he lost the ball. And I was trying to grab for it. And this is the same night. And I went to sleep again. And I dreamt the third dream. And I can't remember what I told my wife I dreamt, but I know I dreamt it. <laughs> Amen. And three nights, uh, three, three dreams in one night where I was active, actively doing things in my dream. Why did you dream that preacher? I have no idea. Hitler was about the only one I can come close to as we watched um, Bullwinkle and Rocky. And I saw a fearless leader and Simon, what's that, what's that boy's name? The black hat dude, Boris and Boy. Natasha. That's the only reason why I can think about even Stephen thinking about Hitler. But when it comes to dreams, they can be funny sometimes, sometimes thought-provoking. I got to use dreams in many lives and people's hearts and minds to help them in the Bible. In our text, we see God warning Abimelech for his life and Abraham and Sarah's protection. Keep in mind one thing that I used to always tell my children when they would have nightmares at night. It's not reality. It's just a dream. Amen. It's not reality. Nothing has happened yet. It's just a dream. There's no monster in your closet. No, this, is, this, this, this is in your mind. Nothing has happened yet. But God can use dreams to become reality. Yeah. The devil can use dreams to become a reality. I'm just saying. The dream itself is not reality, but God can use them to become reality. Let's start with the definition of basic dreams, biblical dreams, daydreams, and visions. And I, I'm hoping we'll be able to make some, some headway with this. I've got quite a bit I want to say before we get to the text here. But basic dreams, let's talk about that first. Basic dreams, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll have them. This is on Wikipedia, so this is free information. A dream is a succession of images, ideas, emotions, and sensations that usually occur, notice the word, involuntarily involuntarily in the mind during certain stages of sleep. Oftentimes, it can be from what you're thinking, like me with uh, Fearless Leader and Boris and Natasha, or sometimes randomly and involuntarily on something you never even thought about before. But often it's involuntary and random. Humans spend about two hours dreaming per night. Two hours dreaming per night. And each dream lasts around 5 to 20 minutes, although the dreamer may perceive the dream as being much longer. I mean, you dream, and it seems like it just goes on and on and on, and from one thing to the next thing. And I mean, I've had some dreams where I went to sleep, and I was laughing in my sleep, and my wife wakes me up and says, you haven't been asleep for five minutes yet. But I dreamed a whole lengthy dream in five minutes. And my dreams normally are just foolish stuff. I mean, I don't really have serious dreams. I don't know why, because I'm a serious person. Maybe that's why I don't have serious dreams. Amen. Uh, my dreams are foolish stuff most of the time. Cartoons, being chased by Tom and Jerry. I mean, I have crazy type dreams like that. But it says here, each dream lasts about 5 to 20 minutes. You may perceive it as longer. Get this, animals dream as well. I remember we had uh, Angel over in Belgium, and Angel was laying over there on the floor, and she was sleeping like this. She went, king, 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 king. And I'm looking and thinking, you're a dog. You couldn't possibly be dreaming. Uh, maybe she's dreaming the dog was after her, but she was like, king, 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 king. Then she woke up, and then she looked at me. I'm thinking, I didn't do anything here. Man, it's your dream, your doggy dream. I don't know what you dreamt about, but it must not have been too good because you was trying to run from it. Amen. But I see even animals dream. Now, how can you tell that animals dream? They, I guess they have scientific, I have no idea. And this is just what Wikipedia says. Amen. So the basic dream, then there are biblical dreams. And uh, from biblical dreams, I, I copied a page out of the Bible dictionary. And let me read to you what it says about biblical dreams or Bible dreams. 
It says, dreams were used by God to communicate with people. Ecclesiastes 5.3 says, a dream uh, becomes with much business. So that people in the Bible times realized their dreams were usually related to their activities. So they believed that the dream they had was related to their activity. Was not Joseph's dream related to his activity? Was not uh, Pharaoh's dream related to his activity? Was not uh, Daniel's dream related to his activity? Is not Abimelech's dream related to his activity? Yes. So in the Bible, they believed that it was related to their activities. The Bible has many examples of God speaking to people through dreams, both to people who worshipped him and to those who did not. Pharaoh had a dream of seven fat cows and seven thin ones. Joseph interpreted the dream as showing there would be seven years of very good crops, followed by seven years of famine. Joseph also interpreted the dreams of the butler and the baker. Were those dreams related to their activities? Yes, they were. In Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5, the Israelites were told that any prophet or dreamer, notice this, who told them to serve other gods should be put to death. Be careful what you dream and what you tell others to do. Old Testament said put them to death. If they're going to take you away from the things of God, hint, hint, hint. If your dream is telling you to go away from God, hint, hint. Hint. I'm just saying. The New Testament also has examples of God speaking to people through dreams. God spoke to Joseph twice through dreams, once before the birth of Jesus, and again before he fled with Mary and Jesus to Egypt. Dreams, notice this, and visions are not the same. Dreams and visions are not the same. A dream, the person is naturally in, in a natural sleep. In a vision, such as Paul's vision and Peter's, the person is clearly awake. So a dream and a vision are totally different. That's from the Bible dictionary. So we got basic dreams, biblical dreams, then a daydream or a vision. A daydream is a dream that refers during which you are Oh, let me put it this way. A, day, day, a dream refers to a certain event which occurs when one is asleep, whereas a daydream refers to a fancy imagination that takes place in one's mind whilst they are awake. That's a daydream. Now, get this statistic. It says some spend 47% of their waking time on average in daydreaming. Come up to these folks at their job, and they're kind of like, or they're on the job and they're just kind of like. And you can scare them. I get scared quite a bit. <laughs> Doing something, I'm in that daze and I'm, I start thinking about something. And the kids are like, Dad, what happened? I was daydreaming about something. 47%, that's half the time you're awake almost. 47%. Some of y'all are saying, that's me. Daydreaming. So you got basic dreams, you got biblical dreams, you got daydreams or vision. Visions occurred during the wake hours, whether at day or night. Uh, Peter in Acts chapter 11 and Paul in Acts chapter 16 and verse 9 both had visions. Peter had a vision during the day, whilst Paul's vision was during the night of Macedonia. It was that night he was awake. So it's interesting that biblical visions were informational or in, in, information giving to a degree as to what a person should do. Joseph's in the New Testament was that way. Paul's vision was that way. And Peter's vision was that way. Let's notice the design of biblical dreams. That was the definition of biblical dreams, the design of biblical dreams. What are they there for? The Old Testament, New Testament, both God uses informational dreams many times to lead his people, mainly because in the Old Testament they did not have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit or the completed canon of scriptures. And in the case of Genesis, they did not have the law given at this point either to govern or guide them. So God would often use dreams to help them to navigate the way because they didn't have that. Think about Joseph's dream. He dreamt way back when about how his brothers were going to bow down to him. There was no law at that time. None. But God had showed him what was going to happen in a dream. So the design of biblical dreams. 
The different dreams we'll look at are going to be these danger dreams, which we're going to look at today with Abimelech. And then we'll look at next week, not just danger dreams, but discernment dreams, desire dreams, decision dreams, and direction dreams. Now, there's many more dreams than that, but these are just ones we're going to look at. What does that mean? That we should follow our dreams. I will emphatically say no. 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 Emphatically say no. God gives us more than just a dream. He gives us more than just a dream. Let's start, first of all, in this, these dreams. They're danger dreams. Danger dreams were for impending purposes of danger doom, destruction, and possibly death. Clearly here in Genesis 21 through 3, this is a danger or a warning dream. Notice again in verse 3, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a what? Dead, dead man. I think that's impending. Amen. Yeah. Thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's yeah. wife. Imagine dreaming this dream. No, not, not, of course, for taking somebody's wife. Well, if you did do that, then you should have that dream. But imagine having this dream. You go to sleep, and whatever it is that you have done, God said you're going to die for it. I bet there'd be a lot less crime, wouldn't it? You go to bed, you have this dream, and God says, you are but a dead man, a dead woman, a dead teenager, a dead young person. You're dead because you got what you shouldn't have. That'd be classified more of a nightmare, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. Talk about not nightmare on your street. Amen. If we dreamt this, this would be classified a nightmare dream. Notice, first of all, Abraham's direction, verse 1. Abraham's direction. And by the way, we're unsure of why he did what he did in verse 1. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. Now, why did he move? Last time we saw uh, him, he was back in chapter 18. Go back to chapter 18. And this was when the, the, the announcement was given to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And at the announcement, who was in Sodom and Gomorrah that needed to be rescued? Lot was there. And uh, notice in chapter 18, verse 1, the Lord appeared unto him, this is Abraham, in the plains of where? Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And, of course, he entertains the angels there, and uh, he uh, provides for them. They tell him uh, what's going to happen, how Sarah's going to have a baby, and they make the announcement about uh, Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. He entertains for Lot's behalf, and it ends at chapter uh, 18 and verse 32, and he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak it but this once. Peradventure, ten should be found there, and he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And then the angels, of course, leave. Chapter 19, they go to Sodom and Gomorrah, and of course, get Lot out and destroy the city. And we can come right back in chapter 20 to Abraham, and he leaves from where he was at. Why does he leave? We're unsure. Right. Commentaries believe that possibly as he looked out and saw the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, maybe he feared for his life because Lot was the only one that got out and they would somehow come after him in the surrounding cities thinking that he was responsible since Lot was the only one that got out. So some things maybe for fear he moved. It's not clear, it's unsure, but we do know he moved. And in this move that he made here, uh, this, uh, this move, Abraham's direction, we come to verse number two to Abraham's dilemma. His dilemma. Notice verse number two. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. Now, in verse number one, he's we're unsure of the move, but here he feels unsafe again. Yep. Now, did he not just do this several chapters ago? Yes, he, did. he did. Hold your finger there. Go back to chapter uh, 12 with me. Chapter 12 and verse 13, or 12. And uh, he had just gone through this. Chapter 12. Notice verse number 12, therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, this is his wife. They will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with who? Me, for what? Thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Did God get him out of that pickle? Yes, he did. 
Does he do the same pickle producing thing again? Yes, he does. So his direction, we aren't sure why he did it. The dilemma, we know he felt unsafe. Abraham slipped back into his old lie again, allowed Sarah to be taken again. Before you say, I would not do the same thing. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. You're not turning now, but it said, you better take heed lest you fall. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. For you say, I wouldn't do what Abraham did. I, God got me out of the pickle once. I'm not getting in the pickle jar again at the same time. Amen. Hey, he was unsure why he moved, but we know he felt unsafe. Amen. You may feel unsafe. You may feel finances are tight. You may feel, I don't trust my child. You may say, I don't trust my husband. I don't trust my wife. I don't trust my boss. I don't trust. I feel unsafe, and so I'm going to lie to make it work. I'm just saying, aren't you glad we have a but God Amen. that steps in when you know you've done wrong and a but God. You know what I find amazing about this whole area here? God's been speaking to Abraham all along. God didn't speak to Abraham this time. He spoke to Abimelech. He did. I find that interesting. He didn't even speak to Abraham. He spoke to Abimelech in a dream. Interesting. Abraham's direction, Abraham's dilemma, he felt unsafe. Notice down in the rest of verse 13. Uh, I'm sorry, not verse 13. Uh, verse number 2, Abraham said to Sarah, uh, his wife, she's my sister, and Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and did what? Took Sarah. By the way, she had already had the promise that was given to her. So it could be that she was pregnant already. It could be. I I'm not sure, but it could be that she was pregnant already. Say, preacher, why do you say that? Because Isaac is born in chapter 21. And so we see the direction, we see the dilemma. We didn't notice the deliverer. God makes Sarah untouchable. Abraham felt unsafe, and that's why he lied. We're unsure why he moved, but we do know this. God made her untouchable. Do you know that God can make some people in your life, make you untouchable to some people in, uh, that want to do you hurt, want to do you wrong, want to do something to you? God can make you untouchable where they can't even get close to you, hard as they may try. But God. But God. <clears throat> I can go on record and say there's been a lot of times that God made me untouchable even when I was in the wrong. Amen, Pastor. Folks, I go back to Belgium the night I was drinking and driving, and I crashed into a house, ran, oh. crashed right into the front door. Y'all know the story. Oh. And I don't know why, but God made me untouchable. They gave me a breathalyzer. I had been drinking since about 11 o'clock that previous morning. I had been drinking all day. Went to the club. My wife tried to put me to bed. I waited till she fell asleep. I went right back to the club, got to the bottom of the hill, and I said, I'm too drunk. I need to go back home. Came right up the hill, ran right into somebody's front door into their house at about 2 o'clock in the morning. They came. They gave me a breathalyzer. And do you know it came back negative? Why did God make me untouchable? I have no idea. I have no idea. My boss came to turn himself in for drinking. They gave him an Article 15 for drinking and driving under wow. the influence, and he came to turn himself in, and he hadn't been drinking. Wow. He had been drinking the previous night, and the alcohol was still on his breath. Why did God make me untouchable, but then touched him? May I go on record to say soon after that he got saved? Well, no, he, no, he got saved before that, didn't he? Yeah, he got saved before that. Why did God make me untouchable? I have no idea. Why did God make uh, uh, Sarah untouchable? God had a plan. Why did God make me untouchable? God had a plan. Why does God make us untouchable sometimes? God has a plan. And even though we may not do right all the time, God says, I'm going to make my plan work with or without your cooperation. What did I say? Uh, do dreams direct our future? Now, let me tell you this. I did have dreams about drink, drinking and driving because I was nervous about it and I knew I shouldn't be doing it. I did have that dream, but I had no dreams about being called to preach, had no dreams about pastoring. Figure that one out. Say, preacher, what kind of dreams did you have? Danger dreams. Abraham's direction, we're unsure. Abraham's dilemma, he felt unsafe. Abraham's deliver, 
made him untouchable. Praise God for the but gods in the Bible. Verse 3 says, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night. Abraham willingly lied and Sarah too. And God had to come and save the day yet again to make her untouchable. I still say take heed lest he fall. Notice the meeting that night. God came to him by night. Why at night? Night is often the best time to talk with someone because there are no disturbances, no interruptions, no distractions. person has nothing to do. And so nighttime is often the best time to talk. My wife and I, we love night times and morning times. Amen. Say, preacher, why is that night time they go to bed? And we can talk all our Amen. smoochy talk. That's good, Pastor. That's good. Daytime before they wake up, we can talk all of our plans, what we want to do. So they don't know what we're trying to do because we have inquiring minds and inquiring minds want to know. So we'll wake up often and we'll discuss and talk. Wait till they go to bed and we'll talk. And sometimes we'll, we'll get that feeling like somebody's listening to us. We go over there and snatch the door, but faith is at the door. What are you doing? I can't ask you a question. No, you didn't. You were spying on us. Go to bed and have a nightmare. No, that's it. Why at night? Normally it's the best time to talk with someone. No, there's no disturbances, no interruptions, nothing to do. Hey, I'll tell y'all the story. Uh, we were going to start the, the school at, uh, and we're looking where we start, start the church at. So we went to the Bonillas Magnet School, and the principal turned us down, man, Pastor Nelson. He said, no, I'm not going to let you use it. He called me back later in the week. And he said, this is Principal So-and-so at Bonillas Magnet School. I need you to come in. And I went in. And I said, yes, sir. He said, I decided to let you have the building. Amen. And I said, really? I said, but you said no. He said, God told me to tell you yes. Oh, there you go. The principal said, God told me to tell you yes. He said, not only that, I'll let you have it on Wednesday, and you can rent it for the library fee, which was like $13 or $19, when it should have been $150. He said, God told me, I wonder, I just wonder, did God, did God give him a danger dream? And said, you told my child what? <laughs> you told him no? Do you know that's a man of God that was in your presence? Do you know that there was two men of God in your presence? Do you know he's trying to save souls by preaching the gospel? Do you know what he's trying to do? You better turn your hiney and call him back in or else. Now, I don't know if that's what happened, but that's what I kind of imagine what happened. Especially when he came back and said, God told me. Because only when we tell our kids, tell them daddy said. Tell them daddy that said. comes with some weight, doesn't it? Yes, you know, sir. sometimes faith comes down. You need to do someone so. They're like, who are you? <laughs> you know, she comes back, daddy said. Oh, oh daddy said. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Mama said. Oh, yeah. Boy, there you go, but if she just said, he said, God said. Yeah. That changes the dynamics. Mm -hmm. But meeting at night. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night, God may have given this dream once before, but we do know he gave it right here. But notice the message at night. Thou art but a what? Dead. Behold, thou art but a dead man. Praise God for intervening for Abraham. Wait a minute, Abraham lied. Yes, sir. Sarah lied. But God said, but you the dead man. Hey, wait a minute. I'm reminded of something. Did not God allow Ananias and Sapphira to give up the ghost in the New Testament when they lied? Yes. Did not Abraham lie twice now? Amen. Ananias and Sapphira lied once, yeah. and they gave up the ghost. Mm -hmm. But God, aren't you, aren't you glad we have a God of mercy? You said, what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? Well, God was making a statement to the church that you don't mess with me. And they died and went to heaven, so that, that's good. Absolutely. Amen. They, they went from lying to flying real quick. Amen. Hey, but when you come down to this, the message that night, behold, he said down there, behold, thou art but a dead man. Otherwise, he said, you're good as dead. Yes, sir. Would you change your ways if God told you you were a dead person if you didn't change your ways? You have one of them Ebenezer Scrooge dreams? Yes, you get the three, three ghosts at night? Three Christmas past, Christmas present, Christmas future? Wouldn't you wake up and do right? Yes, sir. 
Don't we need more dreams like this in America? Some danger dreams? Uh -huh. I, yeah, Jeff, uh -huh. <laughs> Some of us wouldn't get no sleep. Amen. I'm just saying. The message that night, he said, thou art but a dead man. Dead man, dead woman, dead teen, dead youth depends on what we're doing. If God did that, how would it be? We see the meeting that night, but God came to Imelech in a dream by night. The message that night, he said, thou art but a dead man. The man's wife that night, he said, this is why you're but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Hallelujah and praise God. We need more dreams like that in America. We do. We got people laying around and shacking around and laying with somebody else's wife and hanky-panky here. It's all on TV, the bachelorette, the bachelor, and all this foolishness laying around. Hey, we need more danger dreams like this. Somebody say amen. amen. We need more dreams like this to scare some people out of their immorality and out of their foolishness. What did God this happen more often? Sneaking around, laying around, shame on America. God needs to show us some things in our morality. Preacher, we're a superpower. We're a super sinners. That's what we are. We're a nation of sinners. If we can't even get abortion laws right, we're a nation of sinners. It's been there for some 50 years the way it was. It's a shame that we don't have the sanctity of life down yet. And I know there's a lot of degrees to that, so I'm not going to even go into that. I'm just, I'm just saying life matters. If life didn't matter, God wouldn't have sent Jesus Christ for it to matter. He would have just said, die and go to hell. That's what he would have said. But life matters. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son globally that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we see down there the man's wife that night man's wife that night. The meeting, God came to Blemick in a dream by night. The message, he said, you're but a dead man. The man's wife that night, she's a man's wife. God is saying, I want you to take heed what you're doing. So we go from the deliverer to notice the disaster in four and five, Abraham's disaster. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, Wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Abimelech said, I didn't do anything yet. You, you already classify me as dead, and I didn't do anything. But Lord, you're going to slay me and my people? Now, by the way, Abimelech and his nation was far from righteous. But what he's saying is, are you going to hold us guilty for this, and I haven't done anything yet? Abraham's disaster. Verse 5, said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. And the integrity of my heart and in innocency of my hands have I done this. Abraham's disaster. Then look, it's not my fault. This is what we do. He said, sister. She said, brother. What, what have I done? Oh, Christian, don't. Don't set somebody else up because of your sin. Amen. Don't set someone else because of your sin, because you lie. And now somebody gets in trouble because of your lie, your sin, your foolishness. God may not be as merciful to you as he was here to Abraham. We go from Abraham's disaster to Abraham's deliverer. Notice verse 6. And God said unto him in a dream. Notice that, still in a dream. Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. In other words, God said, I know you're innocent. I know you're innocent. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Notice that. He didn't say sinning against Sarah. He didn't say sinning against Abraham. He said sinning against me because it's my plan. This is what I'm doing. The deliverer will come through this lineage. My plan, yep. your sin. He said, I protected you from sinning against me. Do you know God can do some things to stop y'all from sinning? Did he not in the Garden of Eden put a cherub there to save the way? Yes, he did. God can do some things to stop us from sinning. He said down there, For I also withheld thee from sinning against me, therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. I therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. He shall pray for thee, 
thou shalt live, and thou restore her not. And then notice this. And if thou restore her not, know that thou shalt surely die. Not just you. Thou and all that are thine. He said, I'm not going to stop with you. He said, you want her so bad? I'm going to wipe out everybody. You touch her, I'm going to wipe all y'all out. And, and notice Abimelech's reply. Verse 8, therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning. What do you do after you have a bad dream? You wake up. Yeah. You're like, glory, I'm glad that was a dream. Glory. I'm glad that's over. Now I can go back to reality. His reality was Sarah was still there. Yes, sir. That's his reality. And although it turned out to be a disaster, uh, seemingly, uh, the deliverer said, let him go. He wakes up, and notice what happens here. He said, I don't want to be a dead man. Therefore, Abimelech rose up early in the morning and called all his servants, told all these things in their ears, and the men were so afraid. Wouldn't you be too? Amen. Hey, all y'all going to die if we don't do right here. They were all afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, what hast thou done unto me, uh, us? And what have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? And by the way, he hadn't done anything yet. Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not be done. He should have been so ashamed. Abraham should have been so ashamed of himself, getting reproved by a heathen. A heathen. He should have been ashamed. Doesn't it make you feel bad when you get reproved by a heathen when you're a Christian? And they caught you doing something you ought not do. And they had to correct you on something you ain't been doing. I was just telling my family the other day how a cop caught me speeding. And I tried to witness and give him a track. He said, I don't want that. I was so ashamed of myself. I said, I shouldn't have been speeding in the first place. I said, but Lord, maybe you use it for a witness. He said, yeah, a witness of what you not ought to do. I'll be trying to speed and give the cop a ticket. I'll give the cop a track, I mean. He gave me the ticket, amen. Oh, <laughs> uh, go down there, verse 10. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, what sawest thou? That thou hast done this thing. And Abraham said, because I thought, oh, because I thought God can't protect me. Because God can't take care of me. He already did it. Oh, Christian, don't be so afraid. Don't feel so unsafe. Don't be so unsure that God can't take care of his own because he can. He can. Abraham felt unsafe. He said, I thought that you were like this. But God said, but I am like this. I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place. They were slaves for my wife's sake, for my wife's sake. Yet indeed, she is my sister. Oh, he's still trying to get this lie. She is my sister. She is the daughter of my father. You know what Abimelech is probably looking at right now? Spare me. Spare me. You started with that foolishness. Spare me. You know she's your wife. Well, she's my sister, too. Does that count for something? No. Still going to try and get that in there. By the way, Christian, if you're caught red-handed, fess up. Don't try and say, but you don't understand. Kenny, my, my, my excuse was, I didn't see the speed limit. And I didn't in my defense. Because he, he said, did you see the, the speed limit? Did it change right back down here? I said, no. I said, last time I saw it, it was uh, 55. He said, it changed right back down there. It's 45 now. I said, I did not see it. But guess what? I didn't say, so do I not get a ticket now? I didn't say that. I just said, well, I didn't see the sign, so I, write me up if you want to. Oh, yeah, I want to. And he did. <laughs> but, the, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, that is the kindness which thou should show unto me at every place whither we shall come. Say of me, he is my brother. Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham, restored to him Sarah, his wife. And by the way, folks, don't get me wrong, sin still does not pay. Although he gave him some things, sin doesn't pay. It, it does not pay. After this point, you don't find Abraham making this mistake again. He did it twice and almost lost his wife on both occasions. At the very next chapter, God blesses and gives him the birth of Isaac. Notice verse 15. Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleases thee. Was that because of Abraham? No, that was but God. But God. God put such a fear in Abimelech's life. He said, wherever you want to go, you go. 
because God came to me in a dream by night. And God gave me a danger dream, a warning dream. And I ought not lay no hands on you. And so wherever you want to go, you go. What am I saying here? God can send danger dreams. Does he do that today? He might. But I wouldn't say that you should solely base what you do on your dream. You need to go to the word of God and follow the spirit of God and follow the leadership of counselors that God provides to you. You know where I got my call to preach? Sitting in the pew. Yes, sir. You know where I got my call to start a church? Sitting in the pew. I never once had a dream about it. Never once had a dream about pastoring a church. I got it from sitting in the pew, studying my Bible, praying, seeking counselors, Amen. because God does not speak solely by dreams nowadays. And there's more we're going to look at down the road. But praise God for intervening dreams of danger and warning that he can send to people that you work around or people that you work with. I'll give you one last story here, and we're going to close. And uh, this is my same boss that got the DUI. This was before he got the DUI. I had made a comment to him that he didn't like. And he was coming in my office to, in lack of a better word, destroy my career Whoa. based upon some things that I said to him. Now, in all, in all honesty, I said it in ignorance, but he, take, he took offense to that. The night before that, he got saved. My wife and I went by there, led him to Christ. He said, you know what? At the table that he was at, when he knelt at the table and got up, he said, you know what? I was going to write you up tomorrow, and your career was going to be ruined because of what you said. What happened? God intervened. God intervened. God can intervene. Was, was he saved? He was unsaved at the time. And God used that to change the course. Did he dream about it that night? I don't know, but I can tell you this. He changed his mind. And he didn't do what he set out to do. God can withhold people from some actions at times to fulfill his divine plan even when we have done wrong. I don't advocate you doing wrong, and don't you quote me and say, I told you to do wrong. But God can carry out his plan even when we've done wrong, or when we've not done all right, or when we've not done what he told us to do. God's going to affect his plan. But God came to Abimelech at night in a dream. Father, bless now. Maybe some folks here that have been plagued by some dreams that they're having. Lord, there's a, a real danger in following a dream by itself. But, oh, God, with right counsel, with the Spirit of God and with the Word of God, you can make some things happen in our lives. Oh, Lord, I give you praise and honor and glory for what you did in Abraham's life. In Sarah's life, even though they did wrong, Lord, you did right. And although he was unsure and felt unsafe, you made him untouchable. God, help us today in the direction you would have us to go. Some may need to make a decision today. Maybe you've spoken to some, or maybe they've dreamt about being saved. Save them today. Maybe some have dreamt about being baptized. And Lord, I pray they would step out and follow the Bible, not a dream. Maybe some need to join this church today. Lord, I pray they would not follow a dream, but follow the Bible in the Spirit of God, and if they're saved and scripturally baptized and joined this church. Maybe some had some actions like Abraham. They did. They lied. They are not forgiving. They uh, touched something they shouldn't have touched. They're seeing something they shouldn't see. God, help them to turn before they become in danger. Help them to do what you're leading them to do. Lord, take care of it today like you did in Abimelech's life. Give a warning. By the Spirit of God and Word of God, what we ought to do. Help us to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take your hymn books. We're going to turn over to hymn number 387. I will follow. 387. Perhaps today is something you need to do. Something you need to follow. I'm not talking about a dream, but I'm talking about direct guidance of God. What is God having you to do? I will follow 387. stanza 
Heads about eyes closed as G2 sings that stanza. Just think about what God would have you to do. What does he want you to follow? What does he want you to do? I'm not saying a dream. Come on, what the Bible says, what the Holy Spirit is telling you. Maybe to hone your skills as a father, as we talked about last week. Maybe as a mother. Maybe as, as a young person. Maybe to be more kind. Don't let it come to the point where God's got to send you a dream and scare you to death. Follow the tender, leading spirit of the Holy Spirit. Follow the word of God that you know. Follow the preaching that you hear. Follow the multitude of counselors that are there to guide you, to lead you. I will follow. What is it that God would have you do? If you're today without Jesus Christ, let me invite you to come and let us take a Bible, show you how you can be saved and what you need to be saved. If your man will take another man and show you in the Bible what the Bible says about being saved, not a dream. Heads about, eyes are closed, no one looking around. If you're here today without Jesus Christ, why don't you just slip your head up and say, I I I'm not saved. I haven't had a dream about it, but I know I'm not saved. A preacher, could you show me what I need to do to be saved? Anyone at all like that? If you're viewing online, if that's you, why don't you just give us a text, give us a call. Send us an email. Say, what must I do to be saved? And we'd be more than happy to show you what you can do to be saved. The Bible's clear. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loves you. He died for you. He was buried and rose again the third day for your salvation. God can overcome what you do. But oh, don't, don't go down that road. The results may not turn out for you like it turned out for Abraham. It may not turn out for you the way it turned out for Sarah. God made them untouchable. He might not make you untouchable. He might make you touchable. Oh, turn now while you can. Father, thank you so much for what we were able to see in Abraham's life and Sarah's life and Abimelech's life. Lord, we know that in these times when there was no written scriptures, you dealt in dreams oftentimes, and this was a danger dream that you gave to Abimelech, not to, to Abraham, but to Abimelech to guide him. And God, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy that we can see how you spared Abraham and Sarah. And God, we know that solely you don't deal upon dreams. You drill, deal with our spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, and the Word of God, and counselors. So God, help us to distinguish what we should do, the direction you would have us to follow, and help us to follow you and what you would have. Thank you that Abraham did not have to go down this road again. He learned this lesson. Help us to learn ours today. Save that man or that woman or boy or girl that needs to be saved. And God, help us to get to our desired destinations today. Till we meet back again, have your hands upon the viewers online. And then, Lord, Brother Bird, special prayer for him. That you might continue to, uh, Lord, perfect his healing. That he may get right back in the pulpit like you once had him. Thank you for what you're going to do in our lives. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Don't forget the timelines I gave you. The pastor, Pastor um, White and Mrs. White will be out.